finally writing it. I, I now believe in time travel because that has been written. My agent is trying to sell it right now. You say yes and see if it happens, if it works. I wanted to put horror in Miami and, and then destroy it and wanted them to become the vampires in their heads without using the word. All right, and with the push of a magic button, then Russ, we are live. Thanks so much again, uh, Mr. Russ Warnin, for uh, for joining me today. I uh, really, Thank really you appreciate that. So. I, I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. It's great when I can read somebody that I'm expecting is going to be good because I've read their stuff and I get a sneak peek at some favorite authors. Okay. But I'm going to say that what I love even more than that is having somebody that I have absolutely no idea going in completely blind um, until uh, Scarlet over at uh, Journal Stone, who, who of course published your book, yeah. uh, Ghost Flowers, came to me and said, hey, I've got this guy, I've got this book, what do you say? And I read it and I absolutely loved it. So that Thank was you. such a rush being able to not know anything, what to expect. Um, I was about 50 pages into this thing and I just, I, I couldn't put the book down after that. So wow, what a, what a Thank thrill. You so much. <laughs> so, I, yeah, you, no, I really appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you uh, every writer puts their heart into a book and uh, yeah. ghost flowers just hit me right uh, once I once I was given my wife gave me the idea for the novel and it just boomed in my in my head during the next five minutes after she gave me the idea and uh, <laughs> finally writing it um, just I, I, I now believe in time travel because I went back to 1971 and it's it's hard to get it out of my head now seriously I've uh, I mean ghost flowers has been finished for about two years now. And um, I'm I'm still living 1971. Uh, so <laughs> I, I want to <laughs> go out to the store and get a pair of PF flyers. I don't care about the shoes. I just want the <laughs> boy that comes with the uh, the the, t uh, the tennis shoes. Um, I'm wearing the, the shirt. <laughs> Vampire Blood was a toy back in 1971. It was a tube of of Mufi blood that you could buy at toy stores. And I oh wow. Scared yeah, I scared my uh, I scared my parents many times <laughs> <laughs> in that era when I was 11, 12, 13. So, yeah, it was good wow. times. And I'm still reading. That is fantastic. Still, yeah, but thank you for that. That's very very kind of you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um so if I can ask them, so what was the the one idea that um that your wife gave you because I mean with with ghost flowers there's so much going on. I mean, you could even take the you know, the monster out of the story and you need to still have a great story. You could take certain aspects out of it. You still have a great story, but there's so much going on that all culminates into this fantastic, um, you know, culmination of so many different ideas that came together really nicely that, that congealed like vampire blood. It worked really well. So what was the, what was the one idea that your, your wife gave you? Uh, she came to me while, okay. So this was, this was 96, 1996. And, and forgive me, you're about to hear a train go by. We're right next to the train tracks. Okay, no problem at all. <laughs> okay. Right on cue. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, uh, the junction where the, uh, the light is that tells them they have to blow the whistle by law is right behind yeah. our house. So um, That takes a bit getting used to. I used to live behind, beside train tracks, too, and it took me about – two weeks and then I, I loved it it was i thought it was fantastic oh, yeah and, and it took us about two weeks maybe a month for my wife she uh she would it would go by at night and she'd cry after after we moved oh. here and she'd start crying and now it's like was that a train it, you know it, yeah. it just yeah it's, it's gone um <laughs> oh 1996 uh one of the most popular if not the most popular hardcovers on the bestseller list for almost two years, if not more than two years, was uh, the vampire, uh, sorry, Bridges of Madison County, uh, Robert Waller. Yes. And it is a story about, of, of it, two older people who have one night together and that is it. It is not a happy ending. It, it, it is, the thing is my wife and I, we read it. And, you know, for all the, 
popularity of the book, uh, the, the people who absolutely loved it. It is awfully written. It is it is a badly written book. <laughs> <laughs> and she and I would personally, we'd make fun of it all the time. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I used to work at a newspaper. Uh, I, uh, I was awake, shaving, just had my shower. My wife, her head appears in the doorway. I have an idea. <laughs> and that's that's the first thing that told me something is wrong here. She has an idea. <laughs> Usually when she has an idea, it's let's get a new dog or let's get a new cat. Or I have found a new cat and we're adopting it. Uh, but this one was, hey, why don't you write us a really, really bad novel, The Vampires of Madison County? And I just looked at her. I said, that is an awful idea. <laughs> Within five minutes, I knew who the characters were. I knew what would happen. Uh, I knew how it ended. I knew when it and where it took place, and it it was just a goner at that point. I had to I had to write it at that point. Now it took me forever. That was 1996. I uh, yeah. this was in the era I had an agent. Uh, this is in the era where you could still write three chapters and an outline and sell your book to publishers. Right. Uh, so I back in the day, yes, I I wrote the opening. Uh, I wrote the opening chapters. I sent it off to my agent, and nothing happened. Uh, it's uh, it it may have been the era, but it didn't work for that particular uh, for my particular submission. So that's fine. Uh, it came back. I had I ran with another idea uh, that I got simultaneously, which I actually is a novel that I wrote and completed before ghost flowers. And my agent is trying okay. to sell it right now. Um, that said, um, I stayed in the newspaper industry. Real life happens. I, and yeah, sure. You know, you, you can't do a thing about it. Um, yeah. so idea 1996, first three chapters, 1996, real life. I had a, career in newspapers, uh, which was over by 2012 when newspapers started, you know, falling by the wayside. And I, uh, I said, 2013, this is, I'm going to write it. And that's, uh, so I wrote it in 2013, 2014, and now here it is finally published. Um, I tried, yes, going into it in 1996, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll write it badly. Uh, let's see if if I can just write something and, and let it get out there and uh, and sell and maybe do something. Yeah. And then as, as the more I got into it, the more I liked the characters, the more I liked uh, the story. I even I love the antagonist too. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I just uh, I said okay, I'm just gonna write my heart out. And so instead of sorry, dear, <laughs> she's in, she's <laughs> in the bedroom waiting for. Her. My uh, mother-in-law to come, where it's her birthday. We're gonna have a little party for. Her. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and uh, I write. I wrote my heart out, and here it is. So I, I thank you for liking it, and I hope a lot of people like it. Absolutely. Well, it's maybe that says something about my my taste in books, or the fact that you just failed absolutely miserably at writing a bad book because it wasn't. <laughs> It, sorry to break it to you, but it, it wasn't Trust that me. bad. I, I can write that. <laughs> I, can, I can do that. <laughs> that. That's not a problem. Well, I'll be glad to do that for you. My wife tells me that all the time. I do tend to overwrite. <laughs> so I have to cut back. I, I really do. Would, would you say, because I, I know like that's the cool thing I like about this, and I love stories like this too, where you, you read about stories about stories that right. – have taken so bloody long where they're the culmination of, you know, such a long slog fest, whether life happens or you got a million rewrites, like how much do you, um, and I, and I see too, that like on your, on your website, you've actually got the, the first 50 pages, which I think is pretty awesome. So way to, you know, get us all back in that same time machine with you when, you know, the first 50 pages counted whether or not you're going to sell or not. Yeah. Um, how much did the does the uh, the published novel does it represent or does it uh, mirror what those first fifty pages of the bad writing that you did originally, <laughs> or did you change well, it all so it's good? <laughs> the first fifty pages did change a, a little bit, okay, um, but mostly uh, yes, I added uh, the writing did change, the writing evolved, 
just like you know okay. we all evolve. Um, so the writing changed, but also the order of things changed. Um, I, I I love slow burns. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Close Encounters, and yeah. uh, it, it, it's it's a slow burn from the very beginning until Spielberg did the uh, the second version. Um, I, I I prefer the first. Um, so I wrote Ghost Flowers and um, I sent it to an agent trying to get an agent. And she says something has to happen within the first 50 pages. So I had already changed it enough to make it a little bit faster at the beginning instead of so slow. Yeah. So that at that point, I just I just started shifting things around. And part of the first chapter, the very opening pages became part of chapter six or seven. I can't remember. Um, it, it just I just had to Sounds put it back. Right. Yeah, just had to put it back so people would just get into the story uh, real fast. And that, and her advice was really good. Something has to happen uh, to propel the plot within the first 50 pages. Yep. And so the gun's got to go off. <laughs> guns got, exactly. And I so I wrote it or rewrote it. Um, 13 drafts total eventually. Um, so that tells you what how detailed I am. Um, yep. <laughs> but uh, I wrote it and sent it to her and, and she told me I nailed it because I had some, with, by page 48 and 49, 50, something was really happening to say shit's going down in uh, Stonebridge, Virginia. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the fact, too, that in uh, at the end of the book, too, you actually give um, the story of the story. And you, and you talk about uh, some of those things, which I thought was, was super cool. I mean, I'm I'm a bit of a well, I'm not a bit of I'm a complete nerd when it comes to that kind of stuff, like special features, bonuses, things right. like that. Oh, I love and I've that. always felt that, oh yeah, absolutely. And then there's no reason that even though, you know, of course, you know, it's, you get the director's cut of a movie and you've got all the interviews, all the behind the scenes stuff, the shenanigans, right. what have you, there's no reason you can't have some of that stuff in a book. So I think it's really cool when, you know, you get stuff like that, where you basically get a bonus feature. Uh, I love stuff Although like I've that. gotten a little bit better. Hmm? Pardon <laughs> me, sir? No, I, I love stuff like that too. And that's, yeah. that's why I, yeah, my love for it, propelled me to write that at the end, but to do several cool. different things. Plus, as I was writing the book, I realized I'm going to put a real radio station in this story. Um, Which was really cool. Yeah. And and I, now I have no idea if people in where I have placed my town, fictional town of Stonebridge, Virginia, in, uh, in Midwestern Virginia, not West Virginia, but Virginia in the Midwest yeah. part of it, some close to Roanoke, um, but in the mountains. And I don't know if they could have gotten WGH from uh, Hampton, Newport News, Norfolk, which are on the coast. Um, yeah. But I, I'm hoping that somebody, I'm a member of the WGH Facebook group. I'm hoping somebody on that group tells me that I screwed it up or if I got it right. I know that I do know for a fact that even they, the antenna was so powerful, you could, they could receive it in Jacksonville, Florida. The state, they could receive the Jacksonville, uh, yeah. Uh, WGH in Jacksonville during the 70s. That's how powerful the uh, the signal was. So that's kind of intriguing. I hope I did them. I hope I did them right. But yeah, the uh, the fictional town of Stonebridge is an amalgam of several of where I lived. I was I grew up in Hampton, Virginia. It's mostly Hampton, yeah. but okay. the rural areas were um, uh, from Caroline County, where I worked from uh, 2009 to 2012. Uh, at the uh, Caroline Progress, the newspaper there, a uh, very small newspaper, but it was uh, it was fun and uh, it it had an important part. Uh, it had to do with uh, people's lives in Caroline. It was their lifeline to what was going on, and uh, it's a shame it's no longer there. But um, yeah, so I yeah I love uh, addenda like that, and I really liked putting that Definitely. soundtrack together, the uh, the playlist too. Yeah, it's cool. I, I've had um, I've had a chance to talk to a couple of writers that have done the same thing, and um, it's yeah, it's pretty cool, and, and it's neat too because it gives it a bit of a rereadability as well. So I mean, like I haven't read or I haven't listened to the playlist myself yet, um, right. but I would imagine you know, it'd be really cool to read certain sections or even the start of the book and with the playlist because I know you mentioned in the book in, the, in your uh, bonus feature, right? Uh, that you hope that it would 
should play along pretty much the same way at the average mm -hmm. person's uh, re reading pace. So, well, which no, for me is I, slow, so I might have to read faster. Yeah, I was going to say I think the songs will go through a little bit faster than than reading pace, unless you, unless you're a really fast reader. Uh, but I, I did I'm try sure. to, yeah, every song that I mentioned, I tried to include. Um, I found out that I was uh, I had made a couple of mistakes with songs. I wanted to include Brandy, but that didn't come out until the year after the uh, uh, the story takes place. Um, gotcha. And I found out that um, Summer has my my main character, Summer Moore, uh, has different listening tastes than I do, and which I, I thought was incredible. I've never been I've never had a character have as much impact on me as she did because I would be. I would listen to a song and say, okay, I need to include this because that's what I heard on WGH yeah. or, uh, or the FM station WNOR, but she'd come along and say, no, no, you're, you're forgetting this by Janis Joplin. I didn't listen to Jan Janis Joplin. I never listened to Janis Joplin, but she yeah. did. And <laughs> she told me that. So I had to include Janis Joplin. I had to include some other songs that I'd never heard of. Um, and I, these are just accidental songs that I found online um or or reading other books and they they'd, yeah. they'd mention this um and if somebody is really interested in um what's the music scene for 1971 um that show on uh, apple prime the uh, the documentary series about it's called 1971 the year that music changed the world it did um you you got to watch that it's it's really impactful especially about the uh what was go going on with uh American culture and uh, social norms at that time. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely profound. I mean, a lot of uh, stuff that was very taboo all of a sudden started becoming, well, I guess at the time it was really rebellious, but then eventually it became more, more of the mainstream thing. Like I came, I came screaming into this world in uh, good old uh, 1976. So it was a few years yeah. behind 71, but things were fairly, were fairly set then, but I, very I close. Remember, around that time of the year. I mean, music just, uh, it's, it's never been the same. It's never going to be the same. I mean, I, that's true. You know, but I heard of course, Gene Simmons saying rock is dead kind of thing. I'm like, no, it's not, but you know, in a lot of aspects, it kind of is as far as, like, yeah, you know, you're guitar right. at the forefront kind of thing. It, it's not there. I mean, you listen to Spotify, thank God for stranger things because there's two right. of the songs from back then, I guess are like number one and number 10 respectively. And, are they? Everything else in between, that. it's all just auto tuned, you know, crap. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Well, so. pop music is always we are always going to have pop music. I mean, it's it's yeah, not yeah. Only, you know it's popular to the today's generation, but it makes money. Um, yeah. Rock and roll, uh, I would have to say it's if it's not dead, it's um, you know it's in a coma. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. There's a I few of them that are starting to come out, but it's for the most part, it's. Yeah, it really is. Exactly. And I and I look back and I think, how can you have, um, I mean, you had Aerosmith um, at the same time as The Who, and yeah. The Who were doing a rock opera, and, and half the songs don't sound like rock and roll. They, it's almost like a big band. And what is the definition of rock and roll? I'm not exactly sure, but I know, you know, I, it's just like the definition of pornography. I know it when I see it. <laughs> I, exactly. roll, I know it when I hear it, and I'm not hearing much rock and roll nowadays. No, there really isn't. And I mean, thank goodness. Like, I'm up in uh, in Kitchener, Ontario, in Canada. Okay. And I'm so grateful that they get a lot of uh, a lot of the older stuff up here, which has been pretty cool. Um, right. As an example, a couple of weeks back, they had a thing called the Wayback Festival. It was the first one. I hope they keep it up. And yeah. we had uh, who was there? They had Trooper, which. Unfortunately, Trooper wasn't. I mean, I think they might have had one original band member, and they weren't very good. Okay. Uh, but then they had Helix, and they had uh, Lee Aaron, and you know some of those bands. And a while back, uh, they had like Honeymoon Suite and some of these old school, you know, rock bands that are still coming out. And I'm so grateful whenever like some of these guys are still going. I mean, Lee Aaron's 60 years old, and she's still putting out new albums. I mean, I think That's ACDC cool. is still. I think they're going on tour later this year or something, and they're still doing their right. thing. And you know, they're they're rocking out with that heavy blues thing that they they have, and it's yeah. Excellent. But otherwise, that's that, that's about it. It's a, it's a like you right. said that the rest of it I think is kind of in a in a bit of a coma. 
that's the uh, the other genre that I'm into. I'm into blues. Um, the Blues Brothers yeah. got me into it. It was that was old school music <laughs> until yeah. until Jake and Elwood came along and they showed that my generation and succeeding generations that the blues was uh, a vital musical form. Uh, hell, yeah. the Rolling Stones. That's they started out playing the blues. They played with Muddy Waters. Right. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the blues is extremely important to me. I put a little blues, 60s, 70s blues, or 1970 blues in yeah. uh, in Ghost Flowers, but not much because um, it's uh, – she wasn't into the old-fashioned thing, but she was always into the – Summer, my character, was yeah. into the uh, – was more into new material, but there were some songs like, like Joplin, uh, yeah. who was extremely blues based and and her voice her voice was her voice was pure blues absolutely 100% she may have been a rocker but her voice was pure blues yeah um you know it's funny that you mentioned i don't know if you have as a quick aside i don't know if you've heard um i was never a big janice joplin fan as, as well although i certainly appreciated her music and i mean her like you said her voice is so distinct that you yeah, yeah. you can't help at least stop and listen to it just because it's so bloody unique Right. Um, of all the people, um, who was it? Uh, Pink, um, mm -hmm. who I've over the years, I've gotten a bunch bigger appreciation for for some of the stuff that she does. But she I does a version of uh, Janis Joplin's song, uh, Bobby McKee, that is just absolutely incredible. Her voice. I, have, for that. I have not heard that. I'm going to have to listen to that now. But there are uh, two things. There is a wonderful uh, video of Janis Joplin singing with Engelbert Humperdinck. Back in the day, <laughs> it's wow. a wonderful duet. You gotta look. You gotta look for it on YouTube. And uh, <clears throat> if if it's an idea, but if Ghost Flowers is ever adapted uh, for for film, I would love there to be a music video at the end after after all the uh, you know during the credits um, yeah. with um, Pink. Susan Tedeschi, who is a wonderful blues singer and, and guitarist. She's playing now with her husband, Derek Trucks. They're on tour. Um, okay. I think I've heard of Derek Trucks before, actually. Yeah. Can't uh, play his music, but it rings a bell. Joss Stone, who's also got an incredible blues voice. Um, okay. And uh, Carol King, who would, uh, that all of this would be centered around Carol King. I would love if I'm involved in the movie version. If there's ever a movie version at all, yeah. I would go to Carol King and say, can you write us um, a song that would be played on the radio in 1971? Brand new for your voice, for Joss Stone, for Susan Tedeschi, for Pink. And I'd also like um, Jennifer Hudson, if possible. Yeah, um, she's fantastic. Yes. Uh, but the, those ladies together, that's a powerhouse. Uh, yeah. I, I would love any song by the by them would be incredible, and I, I'd love to hear that. That'd be. And am I am I think of the right lady, Jennifer Hudson? She's the one that I think she won or did a runner-up thing on uh, American Idol back in the yeah. day. And like, Dream Girls. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah, saw her probably. actually. Um, my mom dragged me kicking and screaming to the top ten tour for American Idol. I'm like, oh, mom, what are you doing to me here? But some of them are actually fantastic. Um, yeah. She was, she did the song, put a rain on it. And I'm like, right. damn you, Jennifer Hudson. I actually like the song now. Um, <laughs> I think, who was it that did the original one? I want to say Beyonce, I think. Yeah, Beyonce, I was, yeah. You know, my musical taste is here. Beyonce is somewhere way over. You can't see my hand. And I think that that's a good um, representation of where my taste for her stuff I, is, but I love Beyonce in the Austin Powers movie, and other than that, I, <laughs> yeah, she was I good. Know for who that. she is and what she does, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she's a fantastic powerhouse of a singer. I mean, oh, she's yeah, just absolutely. you know a little little dynamite like that voice and that person. Like it was, yeah, yeah, just fantastic. So yeah. Now, are there um are there plans? Because I I could completely see this as a movie. I mean, the one thing that. I absolutely loved about this is I swear you could have made this book twice as long and um, I would have been along for the ride no matter what. One of the things I absolutely loved about this is that nothing, I mean, there's a couple of scenes in the book that were certainly, you know, batshit crazy. Uh, I'm yeah. not going to say what they were. People are going to have to read it and find out for themselves. You wrote it. So obviously you probably have an idea of what I'm talking about, um, especially near the end, that cop scene. And then when they, ah. you know, 
the beast, the the, the monster. Right. Um, but aside from a few key parts like that, it was so naturally unraveling and everything that seemed to be, you know, very, very natural. Like, I guess that's the best way, even though it's, you know, deals with very unnatural circumstances and natural monsters, the story itself and the characters and the way that they conducted and interacted in the dialogue was, was very natural. Well, that's a confluence of uh, the story. I, I can't say that the story writ itself, wrote itself. That's right, it writ itself. <laughs> um, I can't say that it wrote itself, but it came along easier than any other story that I've ever written. And perhaps it's just because it was so, the, the setting was so familiar to me. It was it was like home. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the book before that, The Enigma Club, that my agent is trying to sell right now, was a beast to write. Uh, my general uh, uh, goal, I mean, I'm sorry, my general technique is to outline a book first, outline a novel okay. first. Um, and then if it goes off, then it goes off. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. But at least I have that, that skeleton there that tells me what I'm going to write next. The Enigma Club uh would not let me do that it would allow me to outline a little of the first chapter so i would do that and then i would start writing that chapter would be over and suddenly there's chapter two in front of me i had i could out then outline chapter two so i don't know if there was some kind of a block i don't know what was going on but it, that's never happened to me before ghost flowers however flowed uh it was it was like a torrent at times and um, sometimes pulling a story is, I mean, writing a story is like pulling teeth. I have had a story in my head, the novel that I'm going to write next, and I've already started it. Um, but it's always evolving. I had this, I had this story, I, the first idea for it back in 1981. And suddenly yesterday I'm thinking about it and something new comes to me and says, oh, I've got to change that. So this is uh, it's an evolutionary forty-year-old process for this one book, and I'm I'm really tired of this. <laughs> I, I, I like I, I would prefer to be able to sit down and get something done instead of it telling me forty years later, oh, you fucked up, you got to do something else. So um, yeah, Ghost Flowers yeah. though was uh, was a charmer. It uh, it it reeled me in. I don't know. I honestly don't know how. Sure, I wrote the book. How much of it? Most of it is subconscious. I really believe in in listening to your subconscious when you when you write, because that's yeah. that's where the gems are. I mean, anybody can write a story, but if you pull things, if you allow things to occur, if you allow things, it's improv. It's yeah. it, you say yes to what something happens, or you get an idea, you say yes and see if it happens, if it works. If it doesn't work, you take it out. I, for Ghost Flowers, there was a uh, there was a scene that was giving me a very hard time, and I ended up taking it out of the book. Uh, I wanted to show why and how um, Summer's mother, who is another antagonist in the book, um, yeah. is um, how and why she started to become obsessed with things or obsessive. And uh, I had a, a scene from uh, the 20s, from 1920, when she was sick and she uh, and she had a vision uh, and her father brought her a crossword puzzle book, the very first crossword puzzle book that was ever made. Um, that's it was invented in the early 20s. Crossword puzzles were. And that's uh, I wanted to compare crossword puzzles to. There's a scene where you see she's got a uh, cabinet in her dining room of all these Hummel figures that she's been collecting, yeah. which are just disgusting things. Um, yeah. But she, she would have, yes, <laughs> she, she would have collected them because she thought they were cute. Um, but she would also have them in a specific order, up and down, left and right, whatever's going on in her head. And I wanted to compare that to crossword puzzles and how her mind was either ordered or disordered. I was going to leave that up to you. The scene, I finished it. It was okay, but I ended up taking it out because it just wasn't necessary to the rest of the book. But, yes, the interest understood, yeah. And I, I like the fact that her past is 
very much up to interpretation. I mean, you allude to some of the things that happen to her with her, um, you know, the love of her life. Uh, and you don't even really go into there. You just assume, even though she seems to have a lot of animosity towards her, her husband. Oh, yeah. At the same time, a lot of it is up to interpretation. And you can only assume that she's got a lot of regret, a lot of things that died with the loss of that relationship that yeah. kind of really altered her, her brain. And that, that's like she, she lives in an utter chaos. But at the same time, it's like she's her brain is still trapped in that period of time where she had that great loss and she's doing whatever she can to get some kind of a semblance of order and control over things between the Hummel dolls and you, you got know, it. her her Winston's and of course summer you know summer yeah. is that thing that she's trying to control like a like a puppet but summer's not having it <laughs> no you nailed it that's uh, that's exactly what's going on with her she lives in the past uh yeah. she she always has uh she's on she's borderline narcissistic um in yeah. that her family is more important, not not her husband's family. He left, so she's he's out of the picture, and he and she is he is absolutely despised by her. Even now, he, yeah. I, I think I I think I say he's dead um, yeah. eventually. Um, but yeah, she she very much lives in the past, and I hate to say it, she was uh, one hundred percent based on my mother. My mother had some issues. Um, my mother was a hoarder before we even knew what a, what hoarders were. Um, yeah. yeah, and growing up, I didn't understand things like this, but now, uh, now I do. Um, but um, when creating Summer's mother, I realized it was it was my mother very early on. Uh, now, her mother is worse than my mother ever was. My, <laughs> mother, my mother was a saint compared to her mother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she's just pure evil. But I mean, I think a lot of us that came from those sort of upbringings and that. Um, myself too, to, to a degree, um, you can really relate to it. And I think it just makes it that much more poignant. Like, um, yeah. you know, I grew up in a house full of chronic smokers as well. My, I actually grew up in a house full of women for the most part. Um, and a very knickknack kind of house as well. And I can remember, although, you know, I didn't have the Hummel dolls, thank God. Otherwise I'm sure I, <laughs> you know, that, that would have just, yeah, added yeah. to the trauma, but there was all the other knickknacks, you know, there's a collection of the plates and little figurines and things like that. I uh, remember we used to have like a, a cabinet in the foyer when you first walked in and um, it had all kinds of terrible knickknacks that were always just there. And we actually had a car once. It was a drunk driver that drove through our house and took out that front section of the house. And that was the only, you know, the only blessing of that is that it took out all these figurines. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's like my, you know what? There might have been a drunk driver that crashed that, but that was a very sobering moment for me. That was uh, that was okay. Right. <laughs> and thank God nobody that, got hurt. So. That is awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah. we, we had. I wish we had had somebody drive through our house. Um, <laughs> she did not. My mother in real life did not collect homes. So that this was that yeah. summer's mother. My mother collected Chinese things, uh, food dogs. Oh, okay. Um, cabinets, we had you know, little nightstands, um, never understood it. She was just, you know, her, her way, but that's, you know, everybody yeah. collects something. You've got your, your stash behind sure, you. Sure. I've, I've got I've some knickknacks and yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I, I don't fault them for that, but Hummels, that's a different thing. Hummels, that, that's a whole other, yeah, that's, like that's, that's the stuff yeah. horror is made of. Yeah. And, yeah. It's wrong. It's yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. One thing I always want to ask you too, when I was reading the book, is and I, I might be completely off the mark here, but um, one of the main um, uh, protagonists that you have in here, uh, Hicks, that mm -hmm. was just fantastic. Like, what a great character that that guy is, and I couldn't help but think of him and uh, you know Trager. Um, All right. You know, I don't know if I should spoil it with his name because that, that's kind of a, a bomb drop, I guess, as far as the book goes, because all of a sudden it's, oh, he's not really who he seems to be. If you go right um, ahead. If you want to spoil, you spoil. <laughs> all right. So the guy that we find out is his name is actually uh, Michelle or Michelle or. Right. You're correct. Or, okay. French. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you. And I, yeah, I was, I was thinking, should I put a French accent on there? But probably not. No. I went to Quebec once, tried to speak French, and I was told to speak English. So <laughs> that, that, that's how good my French is. There you um, go. 
so but the um the relationship that uh the trader has um with uh with hicks is great and i was i couldn't help but think of the relationship that you know ramble had with the sheriff of that town it was so similar except i think that this sheriff is is so much more worse um there's, okay. he really doesn't have any redeeming qualities at all i mean not that the sheriff of ramble did i suppose but he, this this guy uh hicks was so much worse did that have any influence at all was that any did no, that, that resonate in your mind at all that's sure yes every time i i wrote something by hicks i was thinking of rambo I, seriously oh, okay that's cool yes um because uh that was that's a powerful novel forget the movie the movie is fine the movie is fine yeah but the, it's a powerful novel first blood and uh david morell is a hell of a writer uh very much yeah the uh but i was also channeling stephen king because when he has when he has a bad a bad good guy uh i mean they're really bad uh i was also thinking of the cop from desperation who has been okay. influenced by the uh uh by the darkness uh in the cave or in the cavern i can't remember it's been so long since i've read desperation um but yeah the uh that said though i knew the sheriff was going to be bad i knew he was not going to redeem himself um at the same time you know you, you have bad characters but they they're also people so you got to give them flaws you got to give them something nice um yeah. I, I i you know he was he was in love at, at one point, had a son, um, but uh, in the 1970s, the son was a draft dodger, so wrote him, wrote him off. So, yeah, um, the guy was an American, uh, uber-American. Uh, yeah. Not, um, yeah, it's, he would be a Christian nationalist if he would be Marjorie Taylor Greene if, if he were alive in, in this <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he um, was he was so despicable, but the, the thing is like you could get a little bit of a little bit of sympathy for his situation more in the more than it's all that that's pathetic, not so much, oh I you know, you poor thing. Right. Um but I, I love the fact that like most of the characters that were in that are in this book, they all have such a uh an arc like a, a very slowly unraveling arc where it's not just all of a sudden where they've got you know a monumental moment well, i guess in a sense summer had a little bit of that where certain situations you know spark something but i found right. that for the most part it was very much uh i since i said spark i want to say the term smoky but it was almost like that where things just slowly emerge from you know from these characters and you get to see other aspects of them come out and i mean hicks certainly was slowly that, unraveling and it's it was really cool to, to witness that that they all have arcs that are completed was accidental um that uh i i had not when i got went into this novel that's not what i was intending but i'm glad it happened um and i i'm not going to say that it was intentional because obviously it wasn't but i do think if you listen to your subconscious your subconscious is going to tell you how to write the story so and that's exactly what in, uh, in this case um that they of course more coffee you you go you go for it i got my <laughs> i got my southern sweet tea right here oh very uh, nice <laughs> yeah no ice yeah it's already cold um but <laughs> that, I, that's slowly building and i don't believe in giving a lot of uh explication uh i mean <laughs> I, I keep going back to austin powers uh, the basil exposition <laughs> he was named that because all he does is tell what the story is going to be what you're going to yep. do that's pure exposition i don't <laughs> I, I like that i and and there is a in the the part of ghost flowers where there is some explanation like that some exp exposition that's the part that i said earlier i had to move back because it took away from the yeah. flow of the story i kept it in there but i but i moved it back and get, gave it less prominence because they did need some background information about these characters I mean, the reader did sure. um but i don't believe in giving too much explication um because it just takes away from the flow of the story so i would much prefer to let things to let you find things out dribble 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 throughout the story or it it becomes known from some for some reason or another uh that's exactly. that has much more impact and it makes it seem more real 
The word yeah, I think it added to the tension too, and it, it was almost like it gave us, you know, this desire to pursue what's really going on and, and to dig deeper, which of course is to keep on reading and read as fast well, as you can. Excellent. Yes, and, and I'm glad you felt that way. I keep no, coming sure. to the word verisimilitude, which um, I, I learned many years ago from Harlan Ellison. And um, he was talking about a story called Croatoan, which is probably one of his best stories. Uh, yeah. Croatoan, it was, I think it came out in 73, prior to Roe versus Wade. And okay. it was a story about abortion. It's, uh, uh, a girl has an abortion, her boyfriend is trying to take care of her, but she's frantic. She has, she's regretting it. She wants him to go into the sewers and find the fetus. Yes. <laughs> and wow, that's uh, that's stuck. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, it's a completely unbelievable story because nobody in the world would do this. Right. But he Harlan Ellison makes it believable using verisimilitude. He deliberately wrote it so that you feel the tension building as the guy starts to think about it. Then he moves closer to the door. Then he's outside in the house. He's getting closer to the manhole. Then he actually takes the manhole cover up and you feel this tension. And is he going to go in there? And what's he going to find once he goes in there? And he makes it work. Croatoan is a hell of a story about Veris. I mean, if you want to look about techniques and verisimilitude, how you build from one part of the story to another and make something absolutely impossible seem credible, Croatoan is a textbook. Um, so, okay. yeah, get that story. But verisimilitude. Yeah, verisimilitude is what uh, Ghost Flowers is all about because it's it's unbelievable to think that a uh, that there's undead in a small southern town uh, in 1971. I wanted to make it very real, and that's the the other reason why the word vampire is not in the book at all. I love that. Yeah, I thought that was so cool. I, I love stuff like that, like where you're reading a zombie book, for example, and <clears throat> the word zombie is not even in there. So yeah. it's yeah, it was really good. And it, it, Stephen King in the first opening chapters of Salem's Lot used that technique, and yeah. they, arguably those are the most powerful uh, portions of of Salem's Lot. That it still remains that and George R. R. Martin's Fever Dream are the two most important vampire novels uh, I think of the 20th century. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes, Dracula had such an impact. Yeah, goes beyond. Yeah, that's different. Um, but, um, the, uh, I've lost my, I've lost my train of thought, starting to think about fever dream and starting to think <laughs> about boats and vampires, ah, vampires. That's why I, yeah, I, that's why I took the word out. You th the word vampire has so many connotations that they're not all positive. Uh, count Chocula, the, the count from Sesame street, um, bad vampire movies. And right. the other thing. Uh, vampire in a book says you're going to talk about the rules of vampirism, which a lot of people, a lot apparently a lot of readers love p writers changing the rules. I didn't want to change the rules. I didn't want to use the word. I just wanted to show them and wanted them to become the vampires in their heads without using the word. Um, and yeah. that make, to me, that makes it more real. Um, yeah, I'm not interested in the rules, although I've been told that I changed some of the rules. I I just I think I just kind of made them more realistic. I, I think so too. And I mean I gotta say, I didn't really get the impression that you changed the rules too much. I mean, as far as horror stuff goes, uh vampires, you know, Dracula, Vlad, all that good stuff has always been my first true love of horror. I mean, I can remember yeah. being a, you know, wee lad. I I probably got the the bite, so to speak, around I don't know, like seven or eight years old. I was a kid. I was always in the occult section, grabbing all the, right. you know, nonfiction, you know, nonfiction as well as the fiction stuff. Uh, Absolutely, reading everything I, I could. So I'm, I'm I like to think I'm pretty up on the, the heritage of vampires. And yeah, when we first meet the, you know, the beast, the the creature, um, the description of them. I mean, that could have been a, a multitude of various monsters, but I thought. That was pretty cool because, of course, one of the big lures of vampires is their ability of, of shape shifting. Yes. But I love the fact that you don't hear anybody over the over the um, you know the, the head with it because there's so many movies out there that, uh, I mean, even I don't know, like Thirty Days of Night as an example. I mean, that's right. 
I think it's it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic vampire movie, one of the better vampire movies that I've seen in, in quite some time. But they still hammer the fact that, like, you know, especially at the end of it, you know, you've got Ashton Couture, who's in the sunlight because he's sacrificing himself, because it's very blatant that sunlight is, is going to kill him. But in your book, you don't have any of that stuff. You just simply describe the reaction to what happens if they get a little bit of sun on them, and it's their... You know they know this you don't have to hammer it so you're really telling the story through the character's eyes because they're not going to think oh here comes the sun i better watch out because they're probably internalizing all this stuff and they're just like oh crap you know they got burned and these things are actually happening exactly but they don't it's not it over to, i thought that was brilliant it's nothing really to talk about because we're hammered all the time by the vampire tropes right um, but one thing that i wanted to get away from were the tropes that's why there's no coffins here there are yep. uh, I never use the word fangs. I, I say long teeth, white teeth. I, you know, I, I give the impression. Um, yeah. They, yes, they can shape, shape shift, but as far as I'm concerned, they only shape shift into one other form, and that's their id form, which is, that's the beast form. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but no bats, no smoke, nothing like that. Uh, forget yeah. the tropes, forget the trite tropes. This is. <laughs> Yeah, this yeah. is as as realistic as as you can be. Um, I didn't. I never showed. Um, I, did I show? I don't remember showing Summer in her beast form. Maybe I've been asked to do. Uh, it. No, Ben. I uh, sh yeah. I shouldn't say any spoilers, but there was one <laughs> other character that you did, but not uh, not Summer, which I thought was really cool. I mean, I almost wish I could talk to you. Uh, this would be a major spoiler, obviously, because of the very ending of the book, which I thought was beautiful and sad and just incredible. That really leaves a lot up for interpretation. Yeah, to the it does. point where my next question, I guess, really with this, I suppose, would be any plans for sequels? Because I could definitely see how it could go one way or the other. Well, I've, I've got a nurse at my veterinarian who, who keeps nagging me for a sequel. She's read Good. it. And she, she, she Listen to it. her. <laughs> well, thank Nickname you. Nickname her your, your muse. Consider her the boss <laughs> and just go for it. <laughs> that is that is very nice of you. Um, I know. I pretty much know what happens to Summer in within the next couple of years. And I know what's eventually going to happen down the line. I do not know. She has not told me what happens, what the specific things that happened to her in this time period. But I do know where she is. Uh, I mean, the book takes place in 1971. I know where she is and what she's doing in 1973. So she, okay. yeah. So I, I will spoil the end of the book for you uh, or for, for, <laughs> for watchers. Well, for you're you. allowed to do that. You're the author. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, Very going to be angry. They could be angry at you and take it in on your next book. I don't know. <laughs> there you, hey, that's that's fine. <laughs> Read uh, the next one. You don't want to know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout the book, uh, I develop that Summer is a natural born rebel. And at one point, yeah. she understands what's happening to her and what's going on with her and, and Michelle. Uh, their love story is going to end up in her, basically in her death and rebirth. Um and she says, he warns her about sunlight. And she says, look, if I can't have sunlight, I may as well die. Because yes, her, name is, her name is Summer. She, yep. As far as I'm concerned, she is the embodiment of Summer in Virginia. Uh, yep. the, the sunlight, the heat. I mean, it's 97 outside right now. Um, she, she truly embodies the love of uh, Summer, of, of the beach, say. Um, so at the end, she says, uh, well, let's see what happens. And she steps out into the sun, and that's where the book ends. So I'm going to let you decide, you know, what happens. But I'm, I've already told you, she's around two years later. And see, this, yeah, there's, a pre there's precedent for this in, in classic yeah. vampire fiction. Because vampire uh, Dracula could walk in the sunlight. Uh, and right. we don't know, we don't know how or why, but he could he could walk in the sunlight and did uh, in London if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so um, yes, sunlight will kill ordinary vampires. I do not think summer is ordinary in any aspect. But what was that other movie? I'm trying to th I'm having a complete brain fart now. There was a movie with Ethan Hawke. It was it was a very good movie, 
um, where there was vampires and there are certain breeds of them where some of them could walk in the daylight and others couldn't. Oh, okay. And he could. So Ethan Hawke and, oh, there's an older dude. I, Willem Dafoe, I believe was it. Yeah. Willem Dafoe. Okay. Um, he was, not- he was a vampire as well. Um, I'm going to have to IMDB this stuff because it, and I'll recommend it to you if you haven't seen it. It's a, it's a great vampire movie. I would like and to see it. Yeah. I want to say it's called, that, but I, I can't be right. But anyways, I, I saw it on the big screen a, while, a number of years ago, and I just thought that the idea of having these, and I guess that was the whole premise of this, was that, you know, that there's these vampires that are walking amongst us in the daylight, and any one of them could be us kind of thing, and you just don't know who it is. And I thought that I that idea was just creepy as all hell, and I thought that was such a cool idea, and That's I could see... And at the end of summer, I thought, Jesus. So she's like, screw the rules. And she just, because she just had this incredibly sad thing happen to her, you know, I guess she just like, that's it. Screw it all. I'm just going to go up in flames kind of thing. But I, at the end, end of it all, and I I think what you said isn't really a spoiler because when you really think about it, when you really get to know Summer, I, that's just not how she rolls. I think that she's way too rebellious, way too stubborn. And I think if anything, she's going to be like, screw this i'm gonna go on i'm gonna do it my way you know i don't need anybody i'm going to reconcile my loss and i'm gonna make the most of it and i'm gonna chase down what i was meant to be i just couldn't see her sitting down and saying all right you know here i am take me take me alive and you know kind of kind of thing so i think what you said about her being there a couple years i I totally buy that yeah you nailed it yeah she's not definitely not in stonebridge she's i know where she is i know what she's doing uh, and I know yeah. she's how she's doing it, but the rest of her story she hasn't told me yet. So uh, that's that's what I'm waiting around for. In the meantime, I got uh, at least two other books to write. Um, gotcha. Well, uh, do you think that there's a chance that? And here I am. Uh, this is the, uh, I guess the the nerd in me coming out kind of thing. So do you think that there's a chance in between books? Um, you mentioned Stephen King. I know he's famous for, you know, he'll finish a book, he'll put it on the shelf, he'll write a novella in between to distance himself, then go back to the edits. Do you right. think we could see some similar to that uh, to maybe to what's going on with Summer so we get a bit of a teaser and then you get to expand on it later on? Or am I, I, uh, I have toyed with the idea of putting out on my website because I, I really don't do much with my website, but I have toyed with the idea of uh, her diary because she has, uh, be, ever since she was a kid, she wrote a diary. So what if she yeah. ke- keeps a diary for, you know, uh, for, the, for the next two years until the events of the book? Of, of the sequel if if i just if <laughs> if the rest of the story ever ever comes to me um well that but, would play well and i mean you've already set the stage for that because one of the possessions that i know that she she takes is her is her diary she has her diary with her at the end and it's like well why would she keep that shouldn't that be lost in the past unless she's going to keep up with it and her music as well she takes yeah, her yeah. she takes her, her records and her eight tracks <laughs> and uh and uh she, she's you know she's set um where does she go Smart. she follows the sun so she uh, she goes west but first and yeah. i do know this because I, yeah at the end uh he tells her uh, michelle tells her to go to a lawyer um and and get something she doesn't know what she's going to get i know she goes Fine. to the lawyer Gets, gets what she's supposed to get. So, do you know what what it is that she gets yet? Is yeah. you uh, told you that? Okay. Yeah, the uh, I've established I established in Ghost Flowers that these that she and uh, and Michelle have within them the uh, they're basically reincarnated uh, without coming out and saying reincarnated, but they have the essences right. of their former selves in them. And she goes to this lawyer because uh, uh, that is with whom. Michelle has trust and trusted all the diaries and journals of their former selves over the last few hundred years. So okay. she goes and says to him a phrase that I mentioned in the book. Right, um, which is super cool. Where's yeah. that from, by the way, that phrase? Uh, is, it, is that all on your own or that? No, no, that is that is from a text that I cannot remember. You had to ask me. I want to say... <laughs> No, I can't remember. I don't remember where it's from. I want to say it's from okay. Shakespeare. Um, uh, I, I know that Michelle quotes at one point from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, but that's not it. That's that's from something else. Man, you had to ask me the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? 
Uh, you know, I got to put you on the spot a little bit at least. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I could remember, but I think it's Shakespeare. Um, but she right, goes, we'll, we'll put a stake in that question. <laughs> please, yes. <laughs> there we but go. She, she gets those. Uh, she gets those journals. It's a crate. It's it's an actually actually a trunk, and uh, yeah. uh, that's the ac accumulated journals of uh, about 15, 14 or fifteen different uh, uh, incarnations over the years and that's what oh. i loved about that too is that summer is the the culmination of all these other past women that have come before her so of course that makes me wonder well what about treasure what's his deal does he have a lot of these other same in there as well and the cool thing is is that throughout the book you've got and it really did add to the tension and the, the mystery of the whole thing is you've got this faction this ancient faction that is basically like vampire hunters that have been hunting trader all across the world all this time but what happens after that you know of course he's driving he can feel them on his heels he feels he could be in that you know very close to him and, and perhaps right on his ass at that at a particular point in the book but you don't really know what happened with that so i mean there, there's so much in here that i, I think that it, it would definitely lend very well to a to a sequel and I would and I would like to develop that. By the way, I just noticed you've got a copy of Dracula on the, your shelf right behind your head. It's yeah, it actually just came in the mail. Uh, yeah, uh, yesterday. Sorry if you don't. I was going to point it. I actually just threw it on my shelf there because I got it yesterday on there. So it's actually the hundred and twenty fifth anniversary. Um, I'm going to be chatting with uh, Dacker uh, uh, Stoker in a, in a little while. Sorry, my there you go. Yeah. So it's, uh, well, it's got Dracula's guest in there as well, and it's uh, yeah. I just found out about that that edition, and I, it's in my cart on Amazon. So that's that's one oh, of the okay. things I'll probably be ordering later tonight. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, forgive me. You were saying sorry to interrupt you, but you were saying no. That that's fine. Um, what was I saying? I uh, went off the rails on that one regarding. Yeah, just like I thought that it would lend really well to the um, to, to certainly to a sequel with that regarding what's going to happen with this this faction that's chasing oh. Trajan down across the world. Um, when I originally they, I bring in the Hawkborns because they're the, like the Van Helsings, they're, they're like Traeger's Van yeah. Helsings. Okay, and they're going to find yeah. out about her sooner or later. Um, yeah. But my idea when I came up with Ghost Flowers was basically. It would have been a three hundred thousand word novel, so I had to cut a lot out. Um, I was it was going to go from nineteen seventy one into the nineteen nineties, and then and possibly beyond that when uh, when she would have been in her sixties or seventies. Um, gotcha. Yeah, and I decided I. I can't. I, nobody's going to publish a three hundred thousand word novel. Number one, if I were Stephen King, that might be a possibility, but I'm, I don't have that power because uh, yeah. right now they're looking for books no longer than about one hundred twenty thousand words, usually about a hundred thousand words. So, yeah. and that's I made that my goal. Um, so it so I had, talk for the attention spans. <laughs> that, that's yeah, that's true too. Um, so I had to change a little bit, but I left. I I had to leave them in because. Um, yeah, yeah, it does leave room for a sequel, but that was my, not my intent. My intent was just to tell this story, um, that, uh, that there may be a sequel. Um, that's, that's gravy. Uh, but, and, and I, I definitely would love to tackle that, but I, right now, like I said, I've got other things to do, but the Hawkborns were going to be the major antagonist. And then until I realized that, uh, it, it just couldn't happen in, in one book, it, it, that would be for later. Yeah. yeah. And I can definitely see as well, um, you know, it's a great pullback to maybe Summer going back to her roots in a sense, going back to Stonebridge um, regarding her, the relationship that she has with her mom, because right. it's obviously very strained. Um, she hates her mom for a lot of reasons, but it's, it's, it's her mom. Yeah. And the very last scene that you have with, with Summer and her mom is just absolutely heartbreaking. And I thought that, Earlier on in the book, I would have thought that the dialogue that she has with her mom, without spoiling it, would have been like, you know, yeah, okay, that just validates why she should hate her mom and why she should just get her mom out of her life and just be done with the whole thing. But the way that 
<clears throat> you set the stage for that is really just absolutely heartbreaking. And the thing that I think previous in the book would have validated um, Summer's feelings towards your mom, and if anything, would have really helped her to sever those ties, you know, totally clean break and given her that sense of, of freedom and separation from her mom, if anything, drew her further into that connection that she has with her mom. And it was just so powerful that I could definitely see, you know, maybe eventually, I mean, she's a, you know, Summer becomes part of the beast, part of the vampire world. So she's going to live on indefinitely, whereas obviously her mom's got a, uh, you know, an expiration date. So I could see when that goes past due, Summer maybe coming back because she's got that, she had that connection as she left. I could, I could definitely see that working into a sequel. Given, well, thank you, thank you. Uh, given that her mother is of very poor health, uh, yeah. especially at the end, and she's in the hospital. Um, I don't think, I honestly don't think that her mother will live for three more years. And I know, I mean, that's one of the things that Summer has told me. Once a year, she does go back. She doesn't. She only sees her mother, birthday. Uh, and she'll see her two friends from the diner, Tina and Ruthette. Uh, and yeah, that's Ruthette it. Ruthette was a great character. Uh, I love Ruthette. I, I, I'm a, I collect names, not official. I don't, you know, go around and say, hey, excuse me, what's your name? Yeah, that's not good enough. For <laughs> um, but yeah. when I meet somebody, uh, I met at the Caroline Progress, uh, an older uh, black lady named Ruthette. And I just, I just kind of went like, I love your name. Do you mind if I use it in a book? <laughs> she said, no, you go right in. Um, so cool. yeah, that's, that was Ruthette. Um, yeah. She started well, a lot out, of power in a name. So yes, she started out as Hattie. Um, Hattie is a very traditional African-American Southern name. Um, yeah. very, almost, uh, almost a cliche. Um, yeah. and I decided, I mean, when, as soon as I heard Ruthette, I, that's your name. Yeah, bingo. And that's, that happened with Summer too. Her initial name was Cassandra. When I when mm -hmm. my wife gave me the idea, her her name was Cassandra. I knew it was going to be Michelle, and I knew his last name was Darno. Darno is from uh, Tarzan of the Apes. That's the French character in Tarzan of the Apes. Okay. But Cassandra was her first name. Then I I did I haven't read them but I read about them. The, apparently the main character of the Vampire Diaries is is a girl named Cassandra. So I said, well I got to change that. What's her name? Yeah. And she, and I said she is the embodiment of Summer, and that just stopped me right there. Summer. And That's that, perfect. I, yeah, yeah. I I thought so too. It's much better than Cassandra, which I left as I never mentioned it, but that's her middle name. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think there's, I guess you could kind of have that tie in too with, uh, I think, you know, Cassandra Peterson with uh, Elvira. <laughs> oh, yeah. I haven't thought of that. I, absolutely. I had not thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very cool the way the mind works and that. And it works out. It's like summer is just so, yeah. it's got so many connotations in there. And of course, Trager uses that as well to describe his feelings and kind of what she personifies and to him and, that's to the town and his life and it, it works out so so well um I how are we in, doing for oh sorry go ahead no i believe in synchronicity when i'm writing uh and yeah. if if there's a coincidence uh or or something that i'm looking for and two things or three things happen simultaneously i that's that, that works for me it's i, I pay attention yeah. um the original title for uh, Ghost Flowers was Shadows of the Night. It's a direct steal from Dark Shadows from, from 1971, which was canceled in 1971. And um, Shadows of the Night was the original title, and I wanted to change it. And uh, I, I, just, I just thought it was a little too trite. I wanted something more original. And I started thinking of Summer's uh, uh, Garden. And how they how white roses would look in the moonlight, and I I thought I thought of the phrase ghost flowers, and I kept it for a week or two, and at the same time I started reading uh, the weirdest thing, uh, biography of uh, Michael O'Donoghue, a comedian from National Lampoon, the magazine, and he was on the first couple of years of uh, Saturday Night Live. He was Mr. Mike, and 
I'm, I'm reading this and he starts, uh, the, the writer is talking about some nuns or something. And he mentions the phrase ghost flowers. And this is like two weeks after I came up with the phrase. Oh, and I geez. said, okay, that's it. It's ghost flowers. That, that's the sign. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't always believe in signs, but I do believe in synchronicity. So yeah, if, if a couple Absolutely. of things I remember, happen, um I was chatting with uh, Tom Montalioni once about a uh, book that he wrote not too long ago. And there was a character that has a gold tooth in the beginning of it. He's like, I have no idea why I gave this guy a gold tooth. No idea. But then at the end of it all, um, that gold tooth plays an absolutely pivotal part in the in the entire book. And it just ends it perfectly. And he's like, I had no idea that was going to happen. But when I was writing the book, I'm like, ah, that's why he has a gold tooth. That's amazing. Okay. Uh, Whoops. You remember the book? Uh, yeah, it's called uh, Time Walker. Okay, I'm going to write uh, that Time down. Walker. So it's, um, yeah, it's really cool. It's a nice little short novella. He originally wrote it for uh, Weird Tales, but then there was a change of guard and things changed. So he ended up, I actually published that with Journal Stone. Okay, very good. <laughs> which, um, <laughs> which again, synchronicity, there you go, is I actually, um, I think I got a, I saw it on Tom's uh, social media that he had this book and I thought, what a great excuse to talk to this guy if, if he'll he'll have you. I've, I chatted with him before about other stuff, so I thought I got a shot, so I did. And then when I got in touch with Charlotte over at um, uh, Journal Stone, I said, hey, Charlotte, um, or Scarlett, I, I got in touch with you. Uh, Tom said to give you a shout and hook me up with this book. And she says, yeah, here it is. Oh, and by the way, I've got this other book coming out from this guy, uh, you know, Russ Warren, would you be interested <laughs> in checking that out too? And I thought... I can't say, you know, I've got some history with Hell Notes. I used to review for them all the time. They're one of the, uh, you know, one of the first outlets that I cut my teeth on as far as reviews and interviews and stuff. So I thought, ah, you know, there's my rubber arm being twisted. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot, and here we are. So Very good. <laughs> so it was, it was Scarlett is cool. great, uh, and Monteleone yeah. is uh, an awesome writer. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm glad he's uh, being published with Journal Stone. Journal Stone is good. And yeah, it's a um, time travel tale about dinosaurs and a couple of old paleontologists that are actually um, real paleontologists too. So if you like dinosaurs and time travel and Tom Montalioni, you should you should, uh, you should enjoy this one. Joe Haldeman wrote a book that sounds very well. It, it, the way you just mentioned that sounds very similar. They uh, some paleontologists uncover a, wo a woolly mammoth and uh, they take it out of the ground and there's a wristwatch around its arm. And, huh. and yeah, it's a time travel story that starts starts off with that, and it's oh, interesting. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and it's you wouldn't think, at least for me, like I've never been a big, uh, you know, f fantasy kind of guy. I mean, I've enjoyed some science fiction stuff as well, and and but I've never really been a big sci-fi guy. Um, right. So for me, the idea of this book about time travel and dinosaurs, I'm like, that's kind of weird. I wouldn't really go out of my way to read a book like that per se but then i saw of course the author attached to it and i've really enjoyed his other stuff so i thought somebody can pull it off it's going to be this guy and yeah. certainly it, it was so that was a, that was a nice surprise kind of like what i said at the beginning of our conversation where it's cool where i get to read stuff that i maybe wouldn't have read previously but because it's attached to an author that i really enjoy right that's the thrill of discovering all of that and then of course the other thrill on that side of it is Somebody saying, hey, do you want to check this guy out? I'm like, I've never heard of this guy at all. Sure, let's Absolutely. give it a shot. Totally blind. And then, of course, the thrill is, this is great. I'm now going to read whatever he he writes. Those are, those are great feelings. When you find somebody you have no idea that you're going to like and you fall in love with, yeah. with the work. And it may not necessarily be the rest of his or her body of work, but at least that, sure. one, that one thing. I've discovered as I grow older, um, even, even as a <laughs> teen, yeah. I mean, I didn't just like horror. Yes, I started off yeah. with the scary stuff, but I also started off with comic books, um, and sure. and and then I would I graduated to mysteries, and I mean right now I'm <laughs> Lawrence Sanders. His first book was written in seventy in seventy, the okay. uh, the Anderson tapes. I've never seen the movie with Sean Connery and Diane Cannon, but I've seen the uh, hmm. I saw the trailer on YouTube. I said I like it. Yes. One of my goals is to go back and watch all the major movies of the 70s uh, because there's so much that I didn't see other than James Bond, Dirty Harry, you know, the ones every everybody has seen. Sure. But there's little things like uh, Harry in My Pocket. 
with Jan. <laughs> no, I don't have a little area. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Maybe um, you should get that that sewn. <laughs> that, yes. that <laughs> James Coburn in his but... pickpocket. He, so that's he's in your, his name is Harry and he's oh he's okay yeah <laughs> thank you for that explanation <laughs> yeah and, and so there's these little movies that I've never seen that I want to see um yeah, yeah everybody thinks Son of Dracula is uh, uh, Lon Chaney 1942 I think Universal yeah but Harry Nilsson the rock and roller did Son of Dracula in 1974 and Ringo no Starr plays Merlin I need to see this movie. Oh. I've never seen it. I know it's on YouTube, and it's an awful copy, but uh, I, I need to see this movie. So, yeah, um, I, I you you need to read everything. Um, right. I never would have read Fever Dream. Uh, I didn't know who George R. R. Martin was back in the, I want to say it was 79 or 80 when he wrote that. But my wife found it, read it, and said I would love it. So I read it, and, yeah, that just – that opened up a world of historical novels for me because I was never really into historical novels. And I'm still not exactly. much, but if it has interest to me, I, I, I will read it. So, yeah, uh, I think you, you definitely nailed what I feel about all that kind of stuff too. It's, I think just a great story is a great story. Great writing is a great writing, regardless of genre. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm ready to read a straight ahead romance novel, but I certainly have read <laughs> novels. Even ghost flowers, I mean, has a romance in there. Absolutely. And you don't shy away from telling people about it, but it's not your typical romance story. Like it's romance laced in blood and violence. It's it's fantastic. Oh, <laughs> way, way to trick us. <laughs> Look, I, I, it's absolutely honest from the very from the cover. It's a love story yeah. with blood. Come on, that's I, I don't want to lie to you. Um, yeah. it's, how can you get away from a, a story about the undead without talking about blood? And and I absolutely. hate to say it. I, it's it's a little gory at times, but not too gory. I don't think so. I, I, I hope not, because uh, my intent wasn't to be gory, but my intent was to be as as real as possible. The it's uh, a controlled the, violence. I found you know where most of the yes. for the most part you, there's not a lot of the violence, but when the provocation is there for violence, it gets unleashed beyond imagination. Exactly. So I thought it worked really well. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, are what we are we good for time? Do I have time for uh, two more quick questions? Go for it. Cool. So the one thing I, I know you alluded to it in the uh, first part of our chat here um, regarding how you would love to see this on a big screen. I could certainly see it translated really well, maybe even on a mini series. I think, because there's so much going on, I, I think you'd have to take too much out of it to squish it into like a 200-page yeah. script kind of thing. You um, might be right. Do you have any like? Are have you started to to write a screenplay at all for this, or is that something that you're that's a goal, not, or is it just? No, I have it? written I've written screenplays before. I've even written uh, even though my my uh, teleplays were not bought by Star Trek: The Next Generation, I pitched to them <laughs> four times. Okay. Um, I am the reason they stopped taking people more than four times. <laughs> I was meeting with that's the producer. Funny. And he said, you've talked with us for four times and you haven't sold anything. Yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. So he writes that down. Um, so, gotcha. yeah, I have thought about doing it for Ghost Flowers. And I will take, I will ask if I can, if it is ever bought, I will be uh, honest with you. It is being looked at right now by uh, one, by people. Gotcha. <laughs> people, uh, representatives of a person. Um, that's all I know. Uh yeah, uh, yeah. So it, something could happen, but something probably won't happen. I was told. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an intriguing enough story that even if, I mean, it would certainly be a loss to us fans if it does get made into a movie. But I think it's intriguing enough that hopefully, at least, it becomes some some passive income for you to at least you know maybe sell the sell the uh, the rights to this at least continuously. So, well, and hopefully, hey. if we're lucky, <laughs> something happens. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I would I would love to see it happen. Uh, and I've and I've got some ideas about casting, but they don't listen to the writer about casting. That's that's no. completely different. So, it, it, yeah. with luck, they'll let me uh, they'll let me write it. Um, cool. And, and hopefully, if it gets done, you at least get to be a cameo and, and get to be killed by your own, uh, you know, your own self made beast. I would love to be a cop and have my arm ripped off. Yes, <laughs> I, that scene was amazing. 
I will do that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that, that was fantastic. Yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be the dead guy. I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. Um, I've acted exactly. before. I was I was actually in an episode. It's called The New Detectives. It's a show filmed here, and I played a detective. Uh, oh, okay. Ad lib some line. The the uh, the script was actually not much of a script. It didn't have dialogue, so I had to come up with and ad lib my own dialogue. Um, oh, very cool. Was, yeah, that's every now and then that's shown on Discovery. The New Detectives. I played it. I played it okay. in Ohio. Yeah, uh, that was fun. But uh, yeah, I love. Uh, I don't, I don't have a, uh, you know, you got to, in all honesty, to, to be a real screenplay writer, you've got to live out in Hollywood. And I'm not sure yeah. that I'm, I'm a Hollywood kind of guy. Um, I'm more of a Southern guy and, and my writing reflects yeah. that, I think. But um, yeah, I would, I would do the script in a heartbeat because I know I could do it. Perfect. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. So at least there's a little bit of hope for that. So maybe if you know, have a chance so. to chat again, and we'll uh, get some other news on that. But yeah, I understand. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, at least it's out there in the uh, the ethers of the universe. Hopefully something Precise. comes of it. But you know, don't, don't hold your breath. But uh, fingers crossed. Exactly. <laughs> kind of thing, so. That's it. Yeah, my agent said they could respond in two weeks. They could respond in a year. Don't, yeah, exactly. Don't, so don't hold your breath. Uh, it's been about six weeks now, so I'm not my my breath is not being held. Yeah, I remember chatting with with Catchum and you know and that. And I mean, there's some things where like things were just locked up forever. There's some stuff he was glad it never got made because the idea were absolutely horrible. Other right. stuff he's like, yeah, I made some pretty good income on selling the uh, you know the rights to this thing, but nothing ever came out of it. And yeah. you know, ten years later, something came out of a couple of things. So it's. Yeah, you know, in this business, you have no idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Russ, and, and thanks you again so much for for the time too, and the patience. I know we went back and forth on a few different dates and times. Yeah. Uh, no good. So no, you're, uh, good just as long as you know you you cleared up your issues and my issue. I, I I just have mental issues, you know. So, uh, <laughs> um, it, 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 it it's what fuels the muse, right? So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Go so free therapy. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it gets it out. You're absolutely right. It's purging. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. So what is it that we can expect from you later on? I mean, it's kind of cool that you've, you've got uh, the Enigma, I think you said. Ni the Enigma Club. That is the Enigma a, Club. Okay. Yeah. The Enigma Club is a pulp story about pulp stories. So it's kind of meta. But the premise okay. is that uh, somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, there is an island. It's relatively close to Florida, so they, they can get to the mainland easy enough. But there is an island where the pulp magazine adventure stories of the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s are still alive. Um, hmm. and, and there is a club for adventurers and explorers called the Enigma Club that on this island that is only one mile in length and about a you know diameter or whatever um they can basically go across the world having their pulp adventures on this island um and so yeah i've written a novel uh one story i, I wrote two i've written two short stories novellas one was published in fantasy and science fiction a few years ago called the mountains of frozen fire um but that's not part of the novel. That's completely that's a great separate. title. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. But um, the Enigma Club is. Um, it started out as I was writing. I was. I determined. I decided to read all the Tarzan novels that I had not read. I'd read the first ten back in the seventies. Okay. Uh, back in then in the nineties, the same year I had the idea for Ghost Flowers. I was. I, I said I'm going to read the Tarzan novels I haven't read, and it started with number eleven. And then I started thinking, what if I wrote a goofy Tarzan novel? Just uh, have, <laughs> like the, the dumb Lord of the Jungle. Not like, George, uh, George, George of the Jungle. Yeah. <laughs> and that was my first thought. I don't want George of the Jungle where it's all slaps <laughs> and, and kind of stupid. Yeah. But watch out just, for them trees. <laughs> yeah, watch out for them. Like, think of Superman and Clark Kent in the 50s. You know, yeah. that, the, you know the broad shoulder guy that kind of stumbles into things and then has to solve his way out of it that's more a bit of a dark <laughs> so i came up with a name uh and kagor the savage lord of the savage jungle yes 
I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's pure pulp. <laughs> yeah, it's pure pulp. And that and it started making me laugh. And then I told my wife yeah. about the idea and it started making her laugh. I said, maybe I've got something here. So as, <laughs> I'm, as I'm outlining this, I realized that the island itself was taking more precedence in my mind. And I said, I had to ask myself why. So I, again, I listened to my subconscious and because there's a club on the island of golden age adventurers and pulp tropes, you know, a, 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 a goofy Doc Savage, a goofy Tarzan, blah, blah, blah. And that's how the novel came about. Uh, so that has been written. My agent is trying to sell it right now. Uh, I am toying with the idea. I've written one script. I'm toying with the idea of doing what you do, but having a podcast, uh, but it's a fictional podcast. Okay. The exploits, yeah, actually news from the Adventurers Club. So it actually. Oh, that'd be cool. T- says what's going on in the club this month and, a good, you know, whatever. So I've gotten That's the super first. Cool. I like that idea. I'd like to write 29 more and then put them out. Um, but that's going to take some time. In the meantime, uh, I'm uh, working on a novel with a partner uh, who is, uh, she's a reporter, um, but the novel is a cozy mystery and we'd like to start up a series. Uh, okay. My wife loves cozy mysteries, so I'm doing this in honor of her. Um, it's, called, it's called Southern Haunts. And uh, I, the novel that, I'm, that I've started that is really taking up my mind right now is called Shades. That's a horror novel. It takes place in the sunlight in Miami. I wanted to do something, uh, put horror in Miami, and and then destroy it. So basically, <laughs> basically, it's a story that takes place. It's four stories that take place during one summer in Miami, all about how people become shades of them for their former selves because. When you write a book, when you write any story, at the end of the novel, at the end of the story, the main character is changed in one way or another. Yeah. Not necessarily for better, and that's the point of Shades. Miami is a, I, I went to school in Miami. Miami is a, okay. an area of upheaval. It always has been. And it changes people either for good or for bad. And I want to put that in a novel, and at the end, a hurricane comes along, which is intrinsically part of the novel. It's a supernatural hurricane. And I'm just going to have so much fun destroying the entire town. <laughs> I'm looking <laughs> that forward. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward uh, a great deal to flooding Miami. Back it, to it, the whole purge therapy. <laughs> ex- hey, exactly. That's it, exactly. That's yep. right. So that's, uh, that's what's in the future. Awesome. Well, you've got a uh, something. Like you've got a very busy uh, future ahead of you, and I, I, I cannot wait to read some of this stuff. So, well, thank you. Very and um, to give us a chance so that we can follow you in all of this, so we can get uh, the podcast news when when that hits the uh, the airwaves, uh, as well as any updates that you might have regarding your writing, new stuff that you have coming out. What's the best way for us to find out about all that? Uh, I'm on Twitter, Russ Warnham, R U S, just one S. Um, okay. and, uh, I'm, uh, also my russwarnham.com, which unfortunately I don't update very often, but I'm going to, um, yeah. just, yeah, just, and I will, you know, try and get the word out just like, uh, I am here talking with you and talking Perfect. with others. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Hey, my, my pleasure, Russ. It's been, it's been an honor to chat with you too. And, you know, right from the get go, you know, from the book to this conversation, uh, you, you definitely have a fan. And I think that a lot of folks, watching this now they might not have known you before but i think they've uh, they're very intrigued to get to know you and you're writing now so at least i hope so thank you they and should do themselves a favor <laughs> and it, yeah please yeah go read ghostbuster uh, ghostbusters ghost flowers <laughs> tell me what you think please put your reviews out send money to russ wernham pier one any donations will do uh, yeah. <laughs> uh no, gotta fuel the ink yeah, exactly. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's uh, you, you're you're number one on my list, man. Awesome. Thank you very I'm much here, again. You're a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's my little three year old that just ran in. So my uh, my assistant. Very nice, <laughs> hey, little buddy. All right. Thank you All so right, much, Russ. You. you take care. You too. All right. Bye bye now. Uh,